Um, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our second week of the Spring Institute and we welcome you to this session uh, on belonging in, within our Spring Institute of Diversity, Inclusion, Equity and Belonging. And our, our uh, graduate assistant, Audrey Warrington, who is a clinical psychology major, uh, graduate student at Emporia State University, is sharing some of her experiences of belonging through the perspective of a university student um, and sorority leader. So with that, I will say ciao, welcome, bienvenue, and uh, here we go. Uh, we're gonna uh, say, um, Audrey, please share what you have to, to say. And, and, and also everyone who's here, if you would like to chat, please do so throughout, throughout the presentation. Awesome, thank you, Connie. Um, so hello everybody again. Um, I kind of want to introduce myself one more time because I, I see a couple new faces since the last time that I um, did my presentation. I won't go through everything. Connie kind of already introduced me. Um, the biggest part that I wanted to share more information about myself again is Last time I talked a lot about um, how important I think community health is to me and why we need to be involved with it. Um, but I think this time more of my presentation will be um, how I mentioned it's supplemental to Joyce, Connie and uh, Martinez of diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, mine will go into more of inclusion and the sense of belonging this time. Um, but another one of the things that I am interested in, and you guys are going to laugh because I am only 23 and I don't have a lot of life experience yet. Um, but I have always been interested in being some sort of, um, the hype man or the life coach for other people. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of where I'll take this presentation, especially, um, I, I know all of us in this, um, uh, study and in the Zoom are women. And so I'm going to hopefully put a, a fire underneath some of you guys and get a discussion here soon of um, some of the things of women leadership and how we can promote uh, some of the girls in our classrooms and things like that. So that is kind of where I will take this and I will share my own experiences um, on the way of, of there. Um, all right. So we will just dive straight into week two of inclusiveness. Um, and I'm gonna be like how Connie said, talking about female leadership. Um, and let's see, so what is sorority life? Um, I remember last fall when we did this presentation that a lot of the Italians said that you guys don't have um, a sense of uh, like a sorority life or a Greek system. Um, essentially what it is is that it's um, women's organizations on university campuses. Uh, the men's version of these organizations are called fraternities. Uh, each organization has their own like purposes or values, you could say, um, that they strive to embody in their lives. Um, I'm going to dive a little bit um, deeper for you guys to kind of understand what in the world this is. There are 26 different organizations in the National Panhellenic Conference. And so by organizations, I mean, there's like 26 different kinds of these um, women organizations, uh, sororities inside of the national umbrella term of the Panhellenic Conference. And then there's also um, another council called the Multicultural Greek Council. Um, and uh, these groups are where you see a lot of the majority of the people of color in this community. Um, and that's their multicultural Greek council is focused more on uh, rather than like a sense of belonging and um, uh, different traditions, it's culture, sense of belonging and traditions inside their culture. Um, so you see that, um, let's see. For Chi Omega, I'll say that's the sorority that I was involved in. Um, there are 181 chapters across the United States. And so it kind of gets a little complicated when you think of, okay, there's 26 different organizations underneath this umbrella term of a national panhellenic conference, but then each of the 26 has, I mean, we have 181 chapters. So um, 
I guess you could say there are, there's a lot of, of the Greek system around uh, these universities in the United States. Um, so some benefits of sorority life. Um, this was me when I graduated from undergrad. Um, but is so there's academics, philanthropy, uh, professional networking, and then community involvement. So academics, most sororities have a grade point average of minimum that you have to keep in order to be in good standings um, to stay inside that organization. Um, so an example of that is the sorority that I was in um, is the minimum was a 3.5 GPA in order to attend all these social events. Um, so philanthropy, uh, this is a different kind of fundraising for charitable organizations, uh, raising money to give back to the community or some sort of national organization. Uh, Kyle Omega's is Make-A-Wish. Um, and so it just helps children in hospitals if they have uh, fees of some sort. Um, professional networking, this is where I'll be talking a little bit more about and the advantages of uh, sorority life. Uh, there's an en endless amount of alumni that have graduated from these organizations that are willing to help you with your future career because um, you guys are sisters. Um, and then also it's professional networking. It's also kind of a resume builder to be able to put that you were in a sorority um, here in the United States um, because a lot of people do see those benefits that you gain throughout sorority life. Um, I remember actually when I got this position that I'm able to talk to you guys in, uh, that was a big factor of um, like Joyce and Connie being like super impressed that I was in a sorority for four years and I had all these academic benefits and conferences that I had attended um, where they felt confident that I'd be able to, I mean, give these lectures. Um, and then last for this slide is the community involvement. Um, this is, uh, this on campus, most sororities like require you to be in so many different uh, clubs or different organizations outside of your sorority. Um, and so it just gives you more leadership um, in different organizations and different uh, settings within the uh, environment. So now I'm gonna, whoop, yep, okay. Talk about my experience a little bit. Um, so as I had stated a little bit back is uh, I was in Chi Omega, Greek letters are an X and a horseshoe is what we describe to people if they don't know. Um, our colors are cardinal and straw. Um, and the values that represented that we tried to embody and represent as best as we could were friendship, career and personal development, um, community service, uh, campus involvement, scholarship, and high standards of personnel. Um, I, I've, I've been out for a year, so I'm surprised that I was able to <laughs> remember all of those. Um, but those are the things that we tried to live with and I still continue to try to um, bring with me in my life through my graduate studies and relationships that I have with people. Um, there were two other sororities here at Emporia State. Um, so there's Sigma 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 and then Alpha Sigma Alpha. Um, and the three and a half years that I was here in undergrad, I held um, a handful of leadership positions. I think that's on my next slide though. Uh, nope, <laughs> but um, I think I'll talk about it here in a bit, but it did, all these values did shape me into the person where um, I am able to be here and give you these lectures, and I am, uh, have these opinions about community health and wanting to be a life coach and uh, getting me through my graduate degree, really. Um, so another element of our diversity, equity, and inclusion here in our study that we're trying to um, build up a conversation with you guys about the other piece is a sense of belonging. So a sense of belonging is just crucial in our lives with satisfaction, happiness, mental and physical health. Um, I, in my graduate degree, we talk about this all of the time that um, with social media and such, we are, we're connected, but we're also isolated on our phones. And um, being in this group of women in, this, in a sorority, um, I don't know, it's, you have, your, you have your people, you have your group, um, and being with them, you, you just do feel that, that confidence and that joy of sense of belonging. Um, to tell you the story of why I reached out to be in a sorority was in high school and before I was really big into sports, always was in my sense of belonging, had a team, had my girl gang that I was hanging out with. 
And then when I decided to go to college, I was really nervous that I wasn't going to have that group of people um, to be around. And I knew that the sorority was going to keep me accountable in my grades, um, was going to make me do things in the community um, and just give me different opportunities after I graduated. Um, and so then that's, that's my story of why I joined the sorority um, and eventually why I stayed in the sorority to, to be this person that I am here. Um, I'm going to look at the chat, pause a little bit um, and see what we have here. If anybody has any questions or anything, um, you're totally confused about a sorority and you want to know more information. Again, feel free to put stuff in the chat throughout the presentation. Um, if you do not want to talk out loud, I get it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep trucking along. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to share. Audrey, I have a question. Yeah. And that is, um, are there, um, is there like a high omega in any other countries or is it just in the United States? Um, it's just in the United States and a lot of how I said the, the 26 under the umbrella term of the National Panhellenic Conference, all 26 of those are just the, the United States. Um, so, I, and I remember last semester talking to some of the Italians about what they had at um, the universities that they attended and um, what they've heard and friends that they've had was that they were more of like honor societies maybe is the closest thing that you might you guys might have um, that you guys could kind of relate to what I'm talking about. Um, I remember some of the people saying that a lot of it was mostly like men's honor societies, but you still kind of understood the concept of it all. Um, so I guess thinking of that as I move forward. Well, one of the differences I think is that uh, sometimes we talk about um, uh, Greek societies as houses, because mm. you actually, I don't know if it's required, but I think you actually live, this is your living arrangement. You, you mm -hmm. live there, right? Or yeah. if you live in the house? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually this picture that I just moved the slide to, this is, I mean, a smaller version of the house that I did live in. So you were part of this, I guess, if we can call it the concept of an honor society, we were part of this honor society, but then you also all lived in the same house. Um, and it was a requirement for um, the second year of membership to live in the house. But after that, if you didn't want to, you could live somewhere else. But if you still wanted to live in the house, you were, you were able to. So you pretty much ate all your meals in the house and you helped take care of household chores mm -hmm. and tasks, would that be correct? Yep, yep. Uh, so we all had housing um, uh, chores that we had to do once a week. And then uh, we had we actually had a chef that cooked for us. So I didn't have to worry about cooking anything for a couple of years. So that was awesome. And you um, sit together, you have uh, meal times mm -hmm. where everyone sits at the table together. Yeah, right? we would have, it was kind of almost a dining hall during the most of the weeks where you were, I mean, dinner was from five to seven. But on Tuesdays, we would all have, at the same time at 5 30 uh we would all come together for a meal um and our house mom was there who was the one that was supposed to be in charge of us um and then we all would go down to our chapter room and have our annual or not our annual our weekly meeting where we would all kind of be together and talk about our organization and what we were and what we could do um you know you mentioned your house mom and i think every um i don't know if, if the if the fraternities have a house mom, but I know sororities have a house mother. And mm -hmm. does the house mother live in the house uh, as well or come in during certain hours? And what does the house mother do? Yeah, so she, I mean, we're all of, I, there were 40 people that were constantly living in our house here. Um, and so, but we were all from, I mean, 18 to 20 year old girls all living in a mansion pretty much. So, our house mom was kind of our our mom to stay in the house. We had a, a whole different section of the house that was she locked down so nobody would bother her during some points of the day. But she was she lived in the house with us and she had her own kind of apartment over there just to make sure that all of us pretty much stay alive and were healthy. And if, if we needed anything, we could um, knock on her door and she would be there for us. But she was there during that was her job was to be our mom, our built-in mom. Okay, so she 
maybe helped coordinate meals or um, sort of um, made sure the house was locked up or uh, you know secure, everybody was secure. And what what did she actually do? Yeah, I mean, aside from just representing um, a, like a mother figure in all of our lives, um, honestly, I think that what she did was she just, she would come in and check on all of us. She really was just that mother figure and she would get mad at us when we would leave our dishes in the kitchen kind of a deal. Um, she didn't really organize anything because we, I mean, we had like a house cook that would do things like that. And then we had a housing core, which was separate than our housing mom um, corporation. Um, I have one more question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, you might have more to say on that, but is it, it, this is not free, is it? And you don't really, you might have some scholarships, I think, from the, from the sorority, the individual houses. But, mm -hmm. uh, and I can't remember if you described Rush or not mm, to us no. <laughs> uh, already, but um, could you talk about the cost and, you know, how, like, I think it's not like, it, it's kind of expensive. Yeah, and it's then, definitely not cheap. Yeah, and so um, maybe talk about that a little bit because not everybody joins um, a, a, uh, a Greek society. Yeah. And, uh, and then also maybe uh, talk about Rush and Hazy. Okay. Um, yeah, so like she said, it's, it's not cheap. I'm kind of, I guess, bringing it up as it's this, it's this great experience. You have all these different benefits and advantages um, and those are there, um, but Aside from, I mean, you're paying a lot for your living to live in these giant houses. Um, and like honor societies, if you guys are um, familiar with those, you do maybe sometimes have to pay um, once a year, or maybe you pay like a fee for your lifetime membership or something. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of girls and women in the United States, if they don't, um, if they aren't in a sorority in college, a lot of the reasons is because of the finances. Um, you have weekly and monthly dues that you pay for nationals. Um, I mean, my rent alone was a good amount of money because we, we did have, I mean, we had lawn care service, we had cooks, we had our house mom that we had to pay for. Um, then we would um, throw different social events and so then we would all have to buy t-shirts and um, uh, the philanthropy events as well as when it would come out of our social dues. Um, so we had national and social dues and then along with rent and just keeping up to, to live in this big mansion on the hill. Um, so Rush is kind of a big deal. Um, at some sororities, it's a lot bigger than it is at others. Emporia State's a really small college. Um, and so there are only three. Some, I know K-State has like 15 different sororities. Uh, KU the same amount um, so that's just the two other state colleges here in Kansas um, and so there's just like a whole week-long process of you going to all of the houses as um, a potential new member is what they call you um, you'll go to all the houses individually you'll talk to however many girls that they let you talk to um, and then it kind of ends up in you're voting on whatever house you want, but then that house is also voting for or against you as well. Um, so it's it's kind of cutthroat um, to get inside of a sorority <laughs> to say um, the very least about it, um, which I mean, you can say a lot with honor societies as well. You need letters of rec, same for sororities. Um, you need to have a grade point average and you have to pay a few fees. So I, I can see the correlation there, but um, yeah, I think cutthroat could be a, a good way to describe the rush process. Um, but then you get to, you get to run home and have bid day, which is a big party of, yay, everybody, we picked each other to be in the sorority together. And, um, then that's where the sense of belonging does come in of you guys are this whole group of group of girls together. Okay. But did you have a big sis, a big sister? I did have a big sis and I was a big sis to two other people, actually. I think I talk about that here in a little bit. Okay, just um, uh, so go I'll, ahead and skip I'll save over that. that. Yeah, I'll save that. All right. All right, yeah. Thank you, Audrey, that was yeah. interesting. Um, okay, so how did this help me professionally? I kind of talked about this a little bit, 
Um, this actually was a picture of me from one of our conferences. I turned 20 years old <laughs> at the conference um, and it was 2020. So I used their balloons for my own picture. But um, a lot of the times, um, let's see, uh, to, to be able to, to a person who is upholding of the standards in the organization, you kind of have to walk the walk in order to talk the talk. Um, I was um, in a handful of leadership positions in the sorority. Uh, I was the standards board is what a lot of people call it. Um, we called it personnel chair. They, you have so many different requirements that you have to uphold throughout the, the week, the semester, um, the year, um, along with the financial parts, but also just making sure that you're, um, I said one of our values was high standards of personnel. So just holding yourself at the highest point. Um, so to be that position, um, as a 20 year old, making sure everyone else is following the rules, you have to walk the walk in order to talk the talk, um, which is hard when you're trying to uh, have those tough conversations with your peers. Um, let's see, so I talked about meetings. Um, so as this um, personnel chair, and then the next year I actually was the president of the sorority, um, we would get, flown to different conferences and that was awesome because the sorority would pay for it um we kind of just got to dress nice and talk to a lot of really cool people um <laughs> as most national conferences even if you go to educational conferences um and such you meet a lot of different people and uh get to hear different lectures that are really cool um so the first one that i went to was in memphis tennessee and that's actually where comic's headquarters are and then the next one that I went to was in Denver, Colorado, um, at the convention center. So that was, that was awesome. We got to stay in that hotel as well. Um, so it was pretty nice. Um, and actually the, when we went to Denver, Colorado, it was in February, the February before we all had to shut down before COVID. Um, and that's when I turned 21. <laughs> so it always ended up around my birthday and it, it, it was awesome, an awesome uh, celebration to say the least for that. Um, so I kind of talked a little bit about what in the world we do at these conferences. They're kind of like any other educational conferences, um, except in, instead of um, it being about like what your field is, what you're interested in, it was more focused about the sorority. Um, we'd create goals for ourselves um, to be those peer mentors um, and to make different connections with different sororities. I still talk to some of the girls and we still follow each other on social media and they were from different states because we would have all 181 chapters represented in these convention centers. Um, we were put into different groups and it was awesome just to gain those connections and share information of how you're representing your sorority and how um, they are as well. Um, let's see, I don't know. Yeah, so I didn't, I think I meant to talk about <laughs> the big sis earlier, um, we got caught up in a few things, but uh, another thing of being pen, peer mentors and gaining those leadership experiences is you are assigned um, a little sis is what Connie was mentioning. Um, uh, we call them bigs and littles really. And there, I am the oldest of three in my family. So I valued it a lot because I've never actually had a big sister until I did join the sorority. Um, and so it's just an opportunity to have um, a mentor that is knows what you're going through, knows your environment that can help you through uh, school, um, socially, um, and anything else. I I still talk to my big sis. She got married a month ago. I was I was in the wedding. It was awesome. Um, and then I I also am a big sis of two others. Um, one of them is student teaching in Kansas City, and she just got a job, so we're going to celebrate this weekend. And um, then my other one is still a senior in college, so <laughs> she's still doing it. Um, but I know that since I've graduated and moved on, I know that we all will still kind of support each other and be there for each other because um, we have had that strong connection so far um, just in the last three years that has been super cool. Um, Audrey, could I share a real quick little story? Absolutely. Um, I actually was, um, I've been holding out on you. I was actually rushed into Alpha Phi okay. uh, at the University of Iowa. Nice. And um, 
And I remember I, I, I left after my first year, so I wasn't in it very long. So I, I decided to work uh, for a few years. And, but um, after Rush and I was accepted into Alpha Phi, they had this big kind of like a party where um, we would meet our big sis, you know, where um, I, we would could find, we, it was a, a surprise. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know who, who my big sis would be. Mm -hmm. And um, and this was a very large house. It was probably a three story house, and um, lots of bedrooms, a parlor, living room, big kitchen, and all that. And so we had a scavenger hunt, or not? No, we had a what is it called? It's like a scavenger hunt where you get one clue after another, and then you eventually maybe it's not a scavenger yeah, hunt. I mean that sounds like a scavenger hunt. It, it's a it's the kind where you 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 have clues to get you from one place to another mm -hmm. and once you get one clue it takes you to the next location get the next clue and then you know in the end you're going to meet uh the person so i was mm -hmm. going all over this house clue after clue and in the end i'm like in this room and there's no one there and so i look and my big sis was out on the roof <laughs> 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 she had climbed out the window. It was a flat roof. Yeah. But she had climbed out on the window and I looked and she sort of said, like, you know, hi, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I remember it as a lot of fun, you know. Yeah. So it's it's not only just support, but it can be, you know, a lot of creativity, a lot of fun. You, you know, certainly um she was a what I'm sorry that I missed out on getting to know her because um I think she was in the leadership. Of the thing. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that little story with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think my favorite part about that story is seeing how much joy that still came on your face. And you were only there for a year. Um, and it was, I mean, it was at least a few years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, let's see. So now the next slide, I, oh, too far. Okay. The next slide that I have are just other successful women that were in sororities that I thought was super cool. Um, so we have Meghan Markle, we all know Meghan Markle. <laughs> from She was in Kappa Gamma. Um, Alicia Keys, the singer, Alpha Kappa Kappa. Carrie Underwood, it was a Tri Sigma. Um, then we have uh, Ruth here. She was in one of the multicultural um, uh, council sororities that I talked about at the beginning. And then here is Kamala Harris, also um, the vice president um, here. And she was also in a multicultural um, uh, sorority as well. And then Hoda from Hoda and Jenna on the Today Show, one of my favorite shows ever. She was a Tri Delta. Um, and that one's not a multicultural. It's, it was just a regular um, national Panhellenic sorority. Um, but I think seeing some of these amazing women and all that they've done successfully, it's it's almost empowering to see that they came from the same thing that I did um, in different organizations. I know that Tri Sigma was one of the sororities here on campus and they love her. Like they, they that they love being connected to her in that way. Um, so just another way of connection for successful women. And let's see, and this is where I hope that Everybody kind of, there's a fire that gets lit under everybody because um, we, we've seen all of these successful women and we see all these leadership positions. Um, but at least in the United States, I remember um, last semester, just continuing to reference it back, um, that a lot of the Italians were confused that we have a wage gap still. Um, at, <laughs> I am glad for you guys that you guys were confused. Um, I, I wish that for the United States, but that's a, that's a different conversation. Um, so just to get into it, um, let me move you guys a little bit. 46.9% um, of the workforce are women. Um, I can't remember the fact now, but um, in the 60s, it was a lot less than that whenever women started entering the workforce. Um, yeah, I didn't put it in my notes, dang it. Um, but the wage gap, um, this is what was so confusing for um, everybody last semester of why in the world do we have this? Um, and the, the reason that I think Joyce and I uh, came about was that these were just the traditional views whenever um, 
the family setting was that you lived in a pig and Finn house, pig and Finn's house. Um, the man went to work. Um, the woman would stay home all day as the homemaker, take care of the kids. Um, and so the men were being paid more when they were in the workforce. And unfortunately, the numbers that I have on the screen are from 2020. So just just a year ago, these are still relevant numbers, not from uh, people having the bread maker views. Um, so to point that out, it's men make five dollars and twenty seven cents to a woman's two dollars and four cents. Um, and urban jobs is four dollars and eleven cents to women's three dollars and twenty seven cents. So the gap is closed a little bit for the urban jobs, but um, it's disappointing because women contribute to 35% of the STEM, um, I think it's called STEAM now, um, they just added that um, for graduating. Um, so women are also a minority in the scientific research and development, um, which make up less than a third of the world's researches. Um, and let's see, I, my next slide. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So in terms of power of decision making, women do hold that 28% of uh, the managerial positions globally in um, 2019. And that's the same percentage that it's been since 1995. Um, so women still only have the managerial positions at 28% over, I mean, what is that, 25 years at this point, a little bit more. Um, and the political life, while women represent or are represent represented in parliament, I um, remember when Kamala Harris was elected as the vice president, we all were super excited for her. Um, but then there was that that um, statement on the back burner of it's 2020 or 2022. Why is this just not happening? You know. Um, and so they we do now have 25 percent of those seats since 2020. Um, and it's, again, it's just one of those back, back burner statements that you're thinking, can you believe that? Why is that just not happening? Um, so this picture that I have over here, um, I remember reading this article and just thinking what in the world? Um, because this, the article was about, um, are women getting paid enough? Are they doing enough to get paid enough? Um, even though they're doing the exact same things as maybe the men are, are they doing enough? Um, these are some of the countries that have said that women's rights have gone just too far. And um, this was the percentage of men thinking that women were getting paid too much and then women thinking that they, they also were getting paid too much or too little. Um, and so you can see the, the blue square here are men agreeing that men, that women are getting paid too much. And then the black square is women, um, obviously a little bit less um, than that percentile there of women's rights have gone too far. And we've had enough of women trying to get enough pay or um, having that gap kind of a deal. So that, that um, the article was frustrating and I, that is just one of those, the fire I wanted to light underneath some of you guys. Um, but to bring it, oh, yeah, to bring it back to inclusivity and to bring it back into the classroom, because um, that's where you guys are, is how do we can, how do we encourage our girls to be women? Um, what resources do we hold to keep those feeling included in this world where the statistics and country think that women's rights have gone too far? Um, I'm going to have a discussion, I think, right after this slide of um, tying it into inclusivity. So I have a few other um, food for thought questions for you guys. Um, if anybody did want to maybe discuss um, what your country is doing or how you see um, maybe how you're doing in your classroom of how you're encouraging girls to be women, um, I'd love to hear from you guys. I'm gonna look at the chat, see if anybody said anything. Um, Cause being that um, the sorority girl, the, the woman empowerment girl, it does um, 
break my heart to see that some of those uh, men in those countries, those countries, men in those countries, sorry, um, were thinking that um, women have gone too far. We only represent 35% of the STEAM um, world, but we've gone too far. Um, and so it's, it's disheartening to think that that's the world that we live in and um, how do we encourage our girls to be women, I think is a, the biggest question. You know, um, Audrey, I was just kind of thinking, and I know you're probably wrap, about to wrap up your presentation soon, but I was thinking one thing about sororities is that it's, even though it costs quite a bit of money, it's not limited to Ivy League types of universities or private colleges. Okay. In other words, um, you don't need to go to a, to a, to a, um, to a, um, highly selective or Ivy League or even an Ivy public kind of university to be part of a of the Greek system, whether it's a man or a woman, you know, uh, those are open at smaller universities like Emporia State is not a real big one. But um, I think that's pretty awesome that there's these leadership opportunities. You don't have to, you know, for instance, I'll talk about France. In France, if you go to the right college, if you go to the right kind of preparatory college, you will automatically be almost guaranteed success in politics mm -hmm. or whatever uh, discipline you plan to pursue. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking is that even outside of the Greek system, which provides leadership and philanthropy opportunities, there are other kinds of uh, organizations like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Eagle Scouts, you know, at the upper levels, or maybe um, specialized organizations, in, you know, I'm thinking high school, that sometimes even can continue into college. So like, uh, you know, maybe future teachers uh, organizations can be one, or, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurial uh, organize. So I think these affiliations, you know, we can't do it by ourselves. And so when we affiliate with common cause and common purpose, it can be beneficial in, um, in, in, uh, in creating these kinds of um, positive changes in society. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Okay. And now I have a couple more questions for you guys. Um, I encourage you to um, either write these down, put them down for food for thought, um, or if you wanna actually discuss these out loud in the chat, I'd love to hear from you guys, like I said, with um, the other question about being a woman. Um, I'll read these to you guys. And um, after that, that will be the end of my presentation. But what do you guys think has been the biggest challenge to incorporate the diversity, equity, inclusion in your life and maybe in your classroom? Um, what are things you're doing right now in your life to ensure everyone in your life feels safe, whether they are in your personal um, relationships or in those classrooms um, to not be stigmatized maybe as that woman in the classroom or a sense of belonging um, how are you guys ensuring that in your own lives, personal lives? Again, though, food for thought for you guys. Um, I'm, I end all my lectures for food for thought because um, how I said I am just a supplemental lecture to the rest of the diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, but I do encourage you guys to be thinking about these things in your classrooms while you're making your Renzulli um, lesson plans for your students. Um, with that being said, though, my next lecture will be about microaggression, um, and that we're talking about that a lot in my lectures in school right now. So I'm excited to take what I have from last semester and mash it with some of the school lectures that I've been doing. Um, but that will be on March the 10th at, um, noon for, for me, I think 7 PM for you guys. Um, but yeah, that, that is it. So if you guys do have any questions. Um, feel free to email me. I know I'm in your guys' email box constantly with reminders. So feel free to email me with any other questions you may have. Well, I see Joyce has joined us. 
And uh, welcome, Joyce, and welcome everyone that we weren't able to welcome earlier. I'm glad you could be with us today. And um, this recording will appear on the Great Plains Center for Gifted Studies. Please like it and maybe subscribe to it so that when these lectures are posted, if you want to go back and review something, you'll be notified when the lectures are posted. So if there are no other questions, I'm going to give um, Audrey a big, let's all give Audrey a big hand, whether you use your emoticon or wave or something, you know, um, thank you so much, Audrey, for sharing this experience uh, with us today. And um, I'm going to wrap it up and we'll plan to see everybody on uh, that's available on Saturday when Martina is sharing on inclusion at the same time, same place, okay? So have a wonderful rest of the day wherever you are. And I will say ciao and, uh, and uh, abiento, okay? Bye.